Test. There we go. That was weird. Test. Be- there we go. That was weird. Test. Be- there we go. That was weird. Test. There we go. That was weird. Be- okay. Uh, something's messing with my soundboard is what's going on here. How you doing there, friends? Wow. (sighs) The fun we have when you step away for a week and then you come back to stream and then weird stuff happens. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. It's so good to see you. My name is Jeff Fritz. Today, this is another C Sharp with C Sharp Fritz. And uh, it's it's December 13th, 2021. This is going to be our last stream of 2021. We're going to get in and we're going to write some some code today. We're going to learn about APIs. Let me say hello to the, all the folks that are here in the chat room. Hello, hello. It is so good to see you. There, the chat room's right over here. Let me say hello. Hey, uh, Ancient Coder is here. Exy, good to see you. Frances- Francesco, Francisco in Ghana. Hello, hello. Yes, we got we got the sound. It's it's not going to work without it, of course. Um, how you doing there, Nick, on on YouTube? Carl Edwards, you've gone deaf. I've gone mute. Hmm. Uh, yes, we we've got that all fixed. Um, how you doing there, Mohammed in Libya? Good to see you. Um, let me see here. Uh, Adam runs. Hello, hello. Thice VDD. Hello. Here to learn. That's great because I'm here to teach. It works out nicely like that. Uh, <laughs> let me keep scrolling through here. Exy says, "Welcome to Monday." Yes, uh, I was gone for a week. I was speaking at a at an in person conference. I was at the Dev Intersection event in Las Vegas last week. An in person event. Um, it was also co located with the Microsoft M three sixty five event, and um, a tremendous amount of content. Um, about 2000 people were at, were at the events. We had, uh, a bunch of speakers there. So good to see folks in person. So good to see, uh, attendees in person connect, discuss things. I had a, a number of very productive meetings that week. So good to, to see folks getting back to it, getting back to normal in-person events. That doesn't mean I'm, I'm going to stop streaming here. Uh, not at all. Um, it, I, I reach significantly more people streaming here than I do in person. And, and of course there are folks who just wouldn't be able to make it to in-person events at the locations that I'm able to go to. So being able to connect with you wherever you are is of utmost importance to me. How you doing there? Bruce Lane. Let me continue rolling down the list here. Del Riverson, Poyetta, what topic are we going to talk about today? It sh- should say just below me here whether you're on twitch you're on youtube uh you should see that for some reason learn tv is not broadcasting me today i don't know why um i tried to connect and it is not accepting my connection so we are not on i'm gonna i'll try it one more time but learn tv is not broadcasting me today as we try sending data sending data and no this doesn't look good Cut me off. All right. We won't be using them today. Um, how you doing there, Adas in Lithuania? Let me tell you what. I'm gonna put up the I'm gonna put up the timer here. Um it's right there. And make sure that that we go through and 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 we limit our, our opening AMA here for the next 40 minutes. You love learning, but your brain doesn't. Lost wages? Nah, nah. Um when is ClipTalk going to be available open source? It will not be. Um, sorry, that's not something that we're that that I'm going to be publishing. That's something that I've been writing, and I will not be publishing the source for that. Sorry. Ajay is here from India. Hello, hello. Uh, VVG Online, fan of the Belgian football team. That's terrific. Uh, are they playing? Or is there something going on there that I'm missing? Um, all the best to you and your team. Um, I've been, I started watching, um, I started watching Ted Lasso on Apple TV over the last week and, uh, I'm in, I get it. I totally get it. Makes sense. Um, I, I knew a little bit about, uh, English uh, football culture and, um, it's been a lot of fun taking that, that dip into it. So Max, hello to you in London, UK. Yes. World Cup 20, 22. 
coming up uh, in in Qatar. We'll see. Uh, our our American team here will see it, if they if they get out of uh, the Concacaf region here, out of the Confederation of North America Central America football region. Um, last last time around, they didn't make it. They they didn't make it in 2018 into uh, into the finals. But um, so far, so good. Looks like we're going to make it out. It looks like we might make it out with Canada. And Mexico might need to go into the, the playoff round um, with, uh, who is it? It's somebody from the, from the Oceania region. Um, but long way to go before that's all ironed out, though. Um, Craig's tuning in from Birmingham. Anderson from Brazil. Uh, yeah, Brazil. There's a... There's a side that doesn't have to worry about qualifying and getting through. My gosh, the Conmebol Ball uh, region, Brazil, pretty sure they're going to qualify. Brazil, Argentina, a couple others, uh, the usual suspects you see qualify from that region that are really good teams. Um, so, Enrique, how you doing there? In uh, There you go, Argentina. <laughs> Uh, is that is that Duke is Vietnamese tuning in? It's so good to see you. The U.S. women team, women's team, won the last world women's World Cup. They did, yes. And and the the American women's team has been very good in in international play. The men's team, not so much. That's the that's the one that's going to be the, the the tough nut to crack here for us to get through. Uh, hello to you, so Safian in India. Uh, oh my gosh! If, if the states go up against Germany, forget it. We're done. Um, Carl is is. I thought you said you were from somewhere else. No, I'm sorry. I was looking at someone. I was looking at a different name. Carl's dialed in from South Africa. Um, uh, yeah. Welcome to football chat. I'm your host Jeff Fritz, and I'm an American. I'm not exactly probably the first person that should be chatting about football. Um. <laughs> We're going to be talking about building APIs with ASP.NET Core today. We're taking that step, that first step, out of building console apps, working with, um, working with notebooks, learning a little bit of C Sharp, and we're going to start to layer some things on top of it. We learned a bit about Entity Framework Core in our last two streams. We're going to take that knowledge. I want to introduce building APIs quickly and easily with, with minimal APIs. I've started calling them mapped. APIs because that's that's really the syntax that you use with this and let's take that combined technology and see just how easy it is to get started and and be productive with .NET 6. This is a new pattern that has been introduced in the last the last few months with the .NET 6 release. Folks were talking about this as early as um, May, June, July of 2021 but it was um, it, it was evolving at that time. It still wasn't complete. But now that it is RTM, let's talk about it a little bit. Let's get into this and, and see what we, can, what we can learn, get you productive with building APIs. Because there's a number of other folks out there that build APIs and other technologies that don't have quite the ceremony that ASP.NET used to have. So I want to be able to show you this, and we're going to get in and see just how easy it is to get started when we return in January. We'll get into building user interfaces and some of the more interesting web frameworks with ASP.NET Core. So let's answer some of the other questions that are coming in here. Craig says, as an Englishman, happy I'm calling it football and not soccer. Um, I can appreciate that the international audience prefers to call it football. Um, and, and when I am speaking and I know that I have an international audience, like I do when I'm streaming, I, I will pivot from American football addressing that as just football to soccer and calling that football first um the the and, and you i will slip every now and again um but i do do try to keep that of no <clears throat> let me tell you how sad i am that that our our side here in philadelphia uh, uh union philadelphia union um demolished their way through the playoffs uh, amazing goalkeeping, um, really good strikers playing on the team, got to the third round of the Major League Soccer playoffs, conference championships, and that week, six players on the team, six or seven players on the team 
were diagnosed with COVID. All went to the bench. All were, were sidelined, um, including our best striker, our starting goaltender. It literally, he was goalkeeper of the year last year in the league. He should have been goalkeeper of the year this year and didn't and and we fell 1-0 to to <clears throat> New York City who ended up winning uh winning the trophy the following uh this past weekend so disappointing that that our best players were sidelined so we didn't qualify for CONCACAF uh play this coming season but I think that might give them a little bit of rest and give them a little bit more um space to work let me go through a couple of these other questions. What's the difference between Razor Class Lib and Web API? Asks VVG Online. Um, Razor Class Lib is a way for you to package um, components, user interface components, in it as a NuGet package that can be shipped and then referenced by ASP.NET Core applications and Blazor applications. Risky Code asks, can I discuss how secure the API? Not, I, I avoid security in these sessions. Um, I will show you where you can place the the authorize attribute, but authorization is something that my friends on the 425 show, uh, Christos covers very very well configuring because that is a extremely deep topic that I do not want to touch because there are many many different permutations of it, and the the short answer is you dr just drop an authentic and auth authenticate and authorize. Um, you, you drop an attribute on the API and it'll, it will enforce that. Um, Lens on YouTube is a fan of ASP.NET Core, developed uh, their LMS and is working great. LMS? Help me out with the, uh, with the three-letter acronym. Yes, this is a release to manufacturing. This is a release to many. It is working very well. Um, uh, is that St. S on YouTube? We'd like to understand how we can run a .NET application that runs on Mac. You just built it. What goes on with linkers, loafers, and compilers? Loafers? What shoes are you talking about here? How's it different from the Windows runtime? It's a little bit deeper than we get into here. Learning management system. Ah, okay. Um, so it, on, on Mac, it, it deploys a runtime and hosts inside of it the same way that it does on Windows and Linux. It's exactly the same nothing different with it if you decide to publish as a single base as a single file application it it pulls everything in it it does tree shaking linking and pushes everything into one exe file one executable file that gets deployed to mac um do 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 uh, am i going to show jot no um like i just mentioned it's a little bit further a little bit further down than I want to go to. And I, there's folks going to be broadcasting later today, uh, the rest of the week. Christos does a fantastic job covering that content. Um, how you doing there, One Lion? Um, doo -doo -doo. Yep, we'll talk about post, put, delete. Let me get some music playing here in the background. Um, I'm going to go to the EDM playlist today. This is Stream Beats. Now, let's go further down here. Start somewhere a little bit further down. Um, yeah, this is called cozy this is music that's royalty free dmca free that you can use wherever you'd like facebook twitch youtube doesn't matter it's free for you to listen to no royalties no rights being enforced just listen to it have a good time you can even download songs from them or you can listen to them on a playlist on apple music amazon music or spotify like i am Check it out, streambeats.com. Thank you so much to Harris Heller for making this music available for us to listen to today. Is the Twitch stream lagging behind? I don't know. Might be. Could be. Um, I broadcast through Restream on Mondays, and it just gets broadcast out to everybody. Um, yeah, a little cozy EDM. Yeah. A little bit of fun, a little bit of pep in our step here. Um, so, all right. Can I have a session using Docker for .NET apps and it's one of the options when creating a project? Tell you what, TG, I'll put our API in a Docker container that we build today. How's that sound? 
Does that work out for you? Is that is that something that'll work? I think that'll work. Oh my gosh, chat! Thank you. Yes. Oh oh, you are too kind, chat room. I I really appreciate the applause. Um. Uh, Reg Registy asks why and when we should use minimal API whenever you'd like. You have the option of using um, using a minimal API, that syntax. It's been available in ASP.NET Core since 1.0. It's always been there. You can use it whenever you'd like. I, I like to think that when you're building an API, something simple, or even if it's something complex, you're building a user interface in front of some domain logic, some business logic, maybe just a simple interaction with a database or a queue. So you're going to have that code written somewhere else that you might be using for a front end of a web application. Well, just build a simple API in front of those things so that mobile applications or other applications that you want to be able to interact with, with your APIs, with your back office support systems can make queries into that, uh, whether it's fetch data or insert data or whatever it might be, and interact with that in, in an appropriate way that fits in with the rest of your application system. Uh, which is used more, WCF or Web API in production? Ooh. Ooh. It's pretty close. WCF is certainly being rolled off because folks have migrated and updated to Web API. So I'm going to have to lean into w, to Web API, but WCF is certainly... It, it, it was and is a lot of places out there. Um, you love the connection to the simplicity to other endpoint frameworks out there? Seems like a great step facilitated by the open source movement started with Satya Nadella, says Bryant. Um... Satya certainly is is CEO of Microsoft, um, but there very much was an internal um, small group that was pushing open source for a long time, um, led by Scott Guthrie, um, that, that drove that, and um, Satya and the folks approved and, and said, yes, let's do this, but uh, I would give Scott Guthrie, Scott Hunter, uh, Scott Hanselman, uh, other folks named Scott, um, credit with with in initiating that open source movement, and certainly Satya in encouraging and saying, you know what, this is a, a pretty cool way for us to to reach the Microsoft goal of of helping everybody achieve more. Right, that's that is our 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 directive is help everyone achieve more not help folks that that use this piece of hardware use this operating system use this cloud service no help everyone achieve more i don't care wh whether you're using a technology that 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 isn't net you're using a, a tool other than visual studio i want to make sure that you're successful in your career growing <clears throat> whatever solutions it is that you're building building whatever apps that are important to you. I want to make sure you have the ability to achieve more. Can I have sessions? Andy asks, can we have sessions about incremental source generators? Um, that's way far along in advanced topics. Um, let's see if we get there. It won't be until later in 2022, but we'll see. A laugh track? I, I could I could use a laugh track. That'd be that'd be pretty cool. Um, let me see. Can a minimal API serve SOAP style responses for legacy applications? Are you kidding me? SOAP? Um, no, sorry. Um, SOAP style applications are not something that we, we support with ASP.NET Core. Um, there's fantastic, uh, features, capabilities. You can use ASP.NET Framework, ASP.NET 4.8 and the ASMX file structure to build SOAP-based services. Not many folks are, are using SOAP um, going forward today. Um, um, Babak asks on from YouTube, can I host an API in a different machine and call it from another client, from another IP address? Absolutely, yep. 
that's exactly the uh, the, the types of scenarios we want to make sure that you can support, uh, build, uh, install it with Docker and deploy to to your favorite cloud service. And I hope your favorite cloud service is a nice fluffy blue cloud that you can deploy to and and host it there and set up gateways and routing around and and redundant um, services in various data centers around the world. Absolutely. Um, you pumped to hear this right now, Bryant? Well, thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, Eggsy, sorry, the, the Scott command doesn't work on this channel. Um, Bulat, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Bogey, is, is that B Bahogi? A, a Bogey? I'm not sure how to pronounce it, Boji? In India, hello, so good to see you. Welcome in. Um, Bulat um, says, Salam, Jeff, hope you are well. What tech is more preferable for building APIs, in my opinion, OData or GraphQL and why? Okay, I, I've I, I've been looking at GraphQL more and more, and it, it it's uh, come on, it, it's a leveled up, it's an updated version of OData. It does exactly the same things, um, and it, it's going to hit exactly the same problems that OData had. It's just a matter of time until somebody exploits it. The exact it's suscept it is susceptible to the exact same problems that OData had. I'll leave that to you to go and figure out which, <laughs> where those problems are and how to exploit it, but they're there. They're totally there. Um, but which one is more preferable? Today in 2021, GraphQL is preferred. Um, I, I disagree with that. I think it's, it's a mistake. I don't, um, I don't like what they've been doing with that technology. It gets me too coupled to a database. It gets me um, it gives too much insight into the, the structure of my internal systems and, and access to those internal systems to folks that are querying it. So um, my personal opinion, I, I think the OData folks have learned and built a fine set of capabilities around it. I would still build an abstraction, something like gRPC or OpenAPI in front of it. How you doing there, PC nerd? Um, Asis Zhang, microservices are, are essentially web, API, web APIs in .NET. Yeah, yeah. It, that's a little bit of an oversimplification, but yeah. Um, Registy23 on Twitch asks, what's the difference between a RESTful API and a minimal API? Minimal API is built with one line in, in your code, and you're gonna see how we do that map get, map put, map post, map delete. I've taken to calling them, and, and I did see Ancient Coder liked, I, I've taken to started calling them mapped APIs. I think minimal API, it, 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 it minimizes, it, it doesn't give full appreciation of what it does. But these mapped APIs that, that you have, just map requests from a, from a, what looks like a folder location from an HTTP endpoint, into a method that is going to be executed and return some status, some data, um, perform some interaction, and and return that that information appropriately to a a caller. RESTful APIs um, represent uh, representative uh, state transfer. No, I forget what REST stands for now. Why am I forgetting what REST stands for? Um, RESTful interactions. Are, are endpoints that don't that you can query and get back uh, JSON XML you can specify your data type coming back um, you get that feature from minimal APIs in ASP.NET Core we did a lot of that with controllers before but by doing it this way with middleware with these map statements much much faster and for folks that are coming in from other technologies it looks exactly like how they've been writing code. And here's the thing, it's 10 times faster. It's 10 times faster. Are you kidding me? Do it, why not? Uh, so, um, let me see here. There's a NuGet package that allows soap-like responses. Yeah, you can you can layer stuff into there, but it's not something that that we're actively promoting because fo folks should be moving on to the more modern technologies. 
Um, Puyeto says, my project is using ASP.NET Framework and Entity Framework 6. Is it worth migrating to ASP.NET Core and EF Core? Oh, yes. Oh, oh, yes. You're going to see immediate speed improvements, stability, um, security improvements. You're going to see technology improvements. Like you're going to be able to build and deploy with Docker. You're going to be able to build and deploy on your favorite operating system, Windows, Mac, or Linux. Build wherever you'd like. Deploy wherever you'd like. You want to build that application and, and deploy it to Linux? No problem. We got you covered. You want to deploy it into the cloud in a Kubernetes cluster that scales appropriately as needed? We got you covered. The upside of upgrading to ASP.NET Core is tremendous. Check it out. Absolutely, I would suggest you do that. What's the main difference between microservice and web API? Asks Ajay. Um, I would... I would suggest that microservices have more to them than just an endpoint. Um, and that's why I've been calling these mapped APIs and not microservices. There are folks that say microservices have their own isolated database and and uh, not just data store, but, but database and interactions that are isolated from everything else so that they behave independently from the rest of the uh, the application system. And that that helps define a microservice. Um, it's an architecture choice. There's there's many things that you can do with it. Yeah, I see. Alexander says it's it's an architecture choice. You can build it using multiple APIs. Absolutely. And there's other th there's other parts of an application you're going to want to layer around it. Security, queuing. Um, how it interacts with other services, how it deploys, how it scales up and down. It's, it's more than just an API. Um, Hashir uh, asks, um, can I have a session on using GitHub Copilot to create small, non-trivial applications? Well, GitHub Copilot doesn't, doesn't write an application. It's a tool that assists with writing software. Um, I'll tell you what, I have Copilot installed on, on the machine that we're going to be using today. Um, I'll use it for a little bit of our session today so you can see um, how it helps, how it, how it can sometimes get a little overwhelming. And, and I'll let you um, make a decision on how best to use it with your application. Um, getting ready to walk the dog while watching the stream, says PC Nerd. Well, that's fun. Why are there less content tutorials on MVC5, but net, .NET Core is everywhere? All MVC5 content are old, but not updated, says Das P. Um, MVC5, it, honestly, um, the, the move is to encourage folks to check out .NET Core because it is that same MVC structure, that same architecture, but runs significantly faster and is available on every operating system. So that's why, because that's where the time and investment of the team is, and you're going to get much, much better um, interaction and performance. And, and right, the, the new capabilities that support the web are being delivered in ASP.NET Core, .NET Core, uh, .NET 6 now. So that's where you're going to see the interactions. TG asks, what is my prospect for WCF? WCF is uh, no longer being innovated on. It's available. It's very stable. It runs fantastic on Windows. You can build with .NET Framework 4.8 and target WCF. Going forward, though, if you want to build stuff that is cross-platform, that is that, that runs on an open source framework that is uh, built and supported and, and is going to continue to receive innovation, Got to get to .NET Core. I recommend you check out the gRPC bindings for ASP.NET Core. Akrem uh, on YouTube says, the problem is I want to start with .NET 6, but when I get uh, stuck, there is no help because it's new version and the community is not that big. Completely disagree, Akrem. Um, we have folks on, on these channels broadcasting all week long. All of our documentation, all of our... Uh, uh, tutorials on the .NET website have been updated and uh, support .NET 6 um, and everything that you see that is .NET 5 
works on .NET 6. So, um, definitely where I would I would suggest you go because take your technology because .NET 6 is a long-term support release. We've we've put a ton of documentation around it, and there is a um, there's a lot of investment to ensure that it stays the fastest framework out there. On YouTube, Prophegy asks, can map get route to a razor page? No. Uh, razor pages have their own routing defined at the top of the page. Um, we haven't covered razor pages yet, but you define that route by saying with an at page directive, and you specify the route you want that razor page to listen to. Peter is here from Hungary. Hello, hello. Uh, Philippe says, hi, Jeff. Have I done any tutorials on Docker and Kubernetes? No. On the old series, you've said that you're going to cover that topic. Can't find it anywhere. No, I did not go into Kubernetes. Um, it, it, I, I made the decision that Kubernetes is more architecture than it is um, than it is development. It, not architecture. It's more operational architecture than it is a development tool and technology. And quite frankly, the documentation and support for K Kubernetes out there from everybody is dreadful. It is terrible. It is awful. I would not recommend anybody go near it with a 10-foot pole because the cost for Kubernetes scales out of control uncontrollably. It is insane how bad Kubernetes is for folks that want to manage a small application. I wouldn't recommend you touch Kubernetes unless you know it and you know it extremely well and you know what you're getting into because it is not easy to manage and get into it, it it literally it's a world of its own that is something that as a developer i don't want to know i don't want to know i don't want to touch it 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 scares my wallet so um and that's my opinion other folks di will will disagree with me that are experts on that that's fine they can they can have that opinion um but I, I, I've been faced with um, unexpected hosting bills because of that. And I, I've spent enough time trying to learn Kubernetes that I know it's something that I don't need. Um, Siraj on YouTube uh, asks, when should I use Blazor versus .NET Core MVC? Uh, that's like choosing between Pepsi and Coke. Um... Use MVC when you when you want to use the MVC pattern. You want to render things on the server and, and take advantage of that. Use Blazor when you want to try out and, and have that spa-like application that you want to deploy and and run uh, offline in an, in on a device that isn't connected, occasionally connected. Uh, but you can also use Blazor server side and have that component-based uh, framework that is more more akin to web forms. Um, MVC is very, very much targeted towards folks that like the model view controller architecture. So it's your choice. Um, One Punch Mac on you on Twitch asks: Are there any changes required to move .NET Core APIs to Azure Web Apps? Nope. You can you can take a .NET Core API and publish it to Azure App Service quickly and easily. Um, literally, there's a publish button in Visual Studio that'll generate. GitHub actions and send it out there for you. Um, Super Viking on YouTube. How's it going there, Aztec Consulting? Super Viking uh, asks, can you secure a web API using a combination of API keys as well as identity in Azure, or do you have to choose one or the other? I believe you can combine the two, um, but I, I wouldn't mix and match that too much. Andy on YouTube say, I would always use Blazor versus old MVC. That's the direction that I'm going these days. So, um, Tice VDD on Twitch asks, "What is the best way to find the community? Can I recommend a site where to find the community for .NET 6?" I'm, I'm not sure what you mean by find the community. There, there's Discord servers for C Sharp. There's there's tech community out on uh, .dot .NET. If you go there, um, all kinds of places that that you can. Uh, Stack Overflow has all kinds of folks talking about .NET 6. I'm not sure what you what you mean by the community, um, because it, there's lots of websites where folks are interacting with this. So, 
Um, Sean on YouTube asks, is Razor Pages still the advised path over MVC for, paps, for apps that are suited? Three major apps still in .NET Framework 4.8 that will migrate, trying to determine a future-proof solution as much as possible. There is no such thing as a future-proof solution in technology. Let's, let's be clear. How, how future-proof would you like to be? Web Forms is still supported 20 years after it was invented. Is that future proof? Um, MVC is is still supported and innovated on on .NET Framework 13 years after it was released. It's been innovated on and migrated and now has the .NET Core and .NET .NET 6 capability uh, frameworks running underneath of it. Is Razor Pages advised? It's, I wouldn't say it's advised. It's a choice that you can make if you want to build something that's page oriented instead of the model view controller oriented. When you build a razor page, it actually generates a controller for you that connects in and uses that CSHTML razor page as the view. It, it literally is the same thing, just they, they cut out the one piece so you don't have to manage that. Uh, Kubernetes very much is a DevOps thing, yes, but a little bit, it's a little bit overkill for most folks. Um, let me see here, scrolling, scrolling. Um, James Foreman on YouTube says, Kubernetes is for an enterprise team, not so much for inter individual de developers. Totally agree. Cloud engineering can be hard. That's right, Prothogy. Das P, uh, you're very welcome for answering your questions. I'm the only YouTuber who answers all questions with so much information. Thank you. Do me a favor, drop it. I, I love the comments like that um, because quite frankly, folks on, on the, the feedback that I get on YouTube when, when it runs through sentiment analysis is dreadfully negative. Not a fan of that at all. Um, so I, I really struggle with delivering content for YouTube. How am I so chipper on a Monday morning? Asked Richard on YouTube. That's what I do. That's my job. <laughs> um, do, 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 do. Uh, trying to decide if stick with MVC or doing conversion switch to Razor. Watched a Scott Allen video before any kind of suggest Razor. Um, much respect to Scott Allen, um, our, our late friend. Um, who who innovated a lot of the training technology you see folks delivering on YouTube, on Twitch, on Plural Site. Um, much much respect to Scott. I, I always saw him as a mentor, um, as a leader for us as as trainers, um, as as folks that were delivering and answering and helping. Um, I, I would say that that. Razor Pages was a way that, it, in Scott's time, Razor Pages was a way, it was a was a thing that the team was innovating on, and they were recommending folks check out. It was never meant to be a replacement for MVC, and we still continue to deliver both user interface technologies to this day, and support them both. It's all a question of of choice. How do you want to build your application? We want to give you that option to interact with those. Um, so that's the answer, and that answers Dukasoft there on Twitch as well. Um, you're a Unix Linux person at AMD for high performance computing and cloud machine learning workloads. Two alpha, three by two. My goodness, um, I've got my Ryzen, 5900, uh, Ryzen 9 5900 over here. <laughs> um, but I will tell you, I have a GeForce 3700 in there. I don't have an ATI card. Um, but I am... I am very much Team Red over here. Um, I, I, I honestly um, I never really got into ATI cards. So, um, four minutes left on the AMA here. Going to run through these. Uh, I'm sorry. What is? It? I need help with the acronym there, Nick. D A P P S. What is that? Uh, Jens, what's asked? What's the best strategy for sharing business logic from a shared library in Xamarin Forms with a Blazor project? You want to share results generated in the app on a web server. Publish a NuGet package, share a project, share a class library, and reuse it in both places. 
Glasgow Astro on Twitch asks, am I relieved I don't use Log4j? Um, I feel terrible for, for those folks that were just maintaining an open source project, not getting paid for it, and now getting crucified by, by organizations all over the world for, for missing an issue and now going back and fixing it really says something about maintaining and supporting our open source projects out there that you depend on, that you've bet the enterprise on. Um, costs nothing to throw these folks a couple bucks. Throw them a hundred bucks a month if you're depending on their technology. It, it, if, if you depend on a, a dozen different open source projects to, to as for your organization to drop those, those folks a hundred bucks a month each, it, it's less, it, it's pennies compared to how much it costs you to hire a developer and you're making their day, you're making their month because they're getting a little bit of cash that's going to help fund and show that they're appreciated and can continue to build. Any chances of showing Tailwind CSS instead of Bootstrap? Uh, no, because Tailwind is not currently what ships with ASP.NET Core. Um, that We might get into showing that when we get into ASP.NET Core showing alternate frameworks, but we're going to prefer to show those frameworks that ship with ASP.NET. Um, going to hustle through here. Two and a half minutes to go. If I start a new project for my customer, should I use API or gRPC? Uh, gRPC is just a flavor on top of API. You're going to do great with both. Andy Walter on YouTube says, Blazor is future-proof. Blazor has been declared that we will support it for at least the next four years. We're continuing to invest in it. I wouldn't say that it's future-proof. I would say that there's a lot of investment going on there and you're going to be covered for at least the next four to five years. If, if technology shifts significantly, all things change. Arsalan asks, why should I choose Blazor over JavaScript? Um, sorry, that's, that's a little bit too far off topic for less than two minutes to go. I can't answer that question. Um, but I will tell, I, I will tell you, I prefer Blazor because just like folks use like, like node for their JavaScript development. So they have JavaScript front to back. You can do the same thing with Blazor and have C Sharp front to back. Um, yes, there is a C Sharp Discord you can check out. Distinguished Moments. Any plans to have a demo with GPT-3 at any point? GPT-3? No, I don't know what that is, so no. What front end do I use for what now? At, uh, Zealous. Sorry, need context. Uh, Digital Dummy says Kubernetes is pretty fun. If you're in Stockholm. Uh, what's my name, dude? Moving on. I would pick Blazor if you're not familiar. Blah, 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 blah. Gregory White, any chance of seeing Tailwind? You already asked that question. Please don't repeat questions. I read every, uh, every line of chat here. Uh, yes, big love for Scott Allen out there. How does the base href work in index.html? Deployed your WASM app. Despite having a base in the base href, it still goes to slash page. Um, you got something else going on there, friend. What are my thoughts on Python and fast API? It's not as fast as ASP.NET Core. How about Docker? Does .NET app need Docker? Nope. Does Docker affect .NET performance? Nope. Um, Dapper? Dapper, I'm not touching on, on Azure. Da we need to draw a line between these. Azure Dapper, Data Dapper, Azure Dapper, no. Not touching that because I'm not talking about Dapper. Web 3.0, Web 3.0 is a lie. Web 3.0 is a scam. Where do you think that money's coming from? Do you really think people are paying $60,000, $600,000 for a sketch of an ape? I mean, honestly, do you, do you really think people are paying that because they want a sketch of an ape? This is folks moving money out of places where they can't convert their money to more... Um, more uh, valuable currency. Um, all right. Um, excuse me. Um, finishing up here. We are at the end. QA, that should say QA complete. Um, do, 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 do. Yes, I have a very strong opinion on Web3. 
it, Web3 is something that a bunch of uh, venture capitalists in, in Silicon Valley coined in an effort to scam and create their own coins that they're giving folks because they can't afford to actually pay people. That's what I think of Web3. Um, jQuery is certainly future-proof because there's still a lot of folks that use it today. Um, one of my favorite Blazor view, view control toolboxes, Syncfusion, Telerik, DevExpress. Absolutely love them all. Um, I use the, the Telerik um, components in a project that I'm currently wor working on. I'd love to check out the other components. Call me. Be happy to check them out. Um, digital scarcity. Yeah. And NFTs are certainly a lie. Right click, save as. Boom. That $600,000 drawing of an ape I now have somewhere else. You're welcome for streaming this morning. Broken Sword X. Good to see you. Um, Mud Blazer is a pretty cool set of components. Yes, it is. Um, yeah. And, and folks that are saying, oh, well, we'll just issue more coins. We'll just issue more of these. Sorry. It's... It, that's not how these things work. You're trying to hide your funds. Why? Oh, and we're hiding them in public. That doesn't work. Um, Asabla, no, I'm not going to do any advent of code on stream. There's plenty of other folks that are doing advent of code. And quite frankly, I'll let them do that because I guess they don't have creativity to come up with their own projects, their own tools and things that are interesting for folks to work on. Is Node.js worth it to learn? I don't think so, no. It's incredibly insecure um, from, I mean, do file new project and start installing packages and you're gonna see high security warnings come through in an instant. Don't do it. Um, are minimal APIs more performant than classic controllers? Yes. Audic, we're gonna get into that in just a minute. <laughs> well, I wouldn't quite go there at Broken Sword, but I, I, I will say that there are things that I do on stream. There are things that I do as far as submitting and interacting with uh, the tech community where I want to create space for other folks. I want to allow other folks to develop their persona, develop their speaking skills, and... Um, I don't need to to step on their code, their content, their technology. We are going to have F Sharp on soon. Um, I'm actually planning um, a month of F Sharp with our friend Kathleen Dollard. More on that coming up. I'll have more to share at, when we get into 2022. Um, so, yes, let's get into minimal APIs. And Mudblazer, Mudblazer is pretty cool. I appreciate what they've done with that. It is a lot of work to do. Some practical minimal APIs. Yes, let's do that. So, um, moving on from the AMA, and and from what I'm seeing there, yes, I'm one of the only people that does this type of open AMA and answers questions and, and gives you exactly what I think of things. Um, it's, it's not easy to do, and quite frankly... It scares folks to the point where they 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 pre-record everything. I go live with all of this. Um. Oh, that's fantastic, Broken Sword. Thanks so much. And uh, Dukasoft, I'm I'm glad folks like the AMA. But let's get in. Let's talk about uh, building building APIs with ASP.NET Core so that you get speed, uh, scalability durability and and the ability to document and roll those out and run anywhere you want ASP.NET Core seems like seems raw like Node and Express no 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 wait till we see wait till you see we get in there um, will we see an F-sharp version of ASP.NET Core based on minimal APIs no mm -mm. Um, can I show how to structure minimal APIs a bit in a good way yeah, I think we can do a little bit of that. Is this Scott Guthrie? Are you seeing that? Because I've got the red shirt. No. Um, AMA. Uh, AMA, ask me anything is what AMA is. 
So I literally answer any question that's on topic for that first 40 minutes. All right. Let me let's let's grab the things here. Let's get ready to go over to get ready to go over to the other set. Um and and start writing um some code, start talking about minimal APIs, what it means, how we can use them, how they can grow, how we can structure them. I see some questions coming in here. Let's get that set up. I am I got to grab my phone while I, while I make the walk over here to the other uh to the other set and uh yeah let's get over to the other set oh uh, do, 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 do. here we go let's head over and i'll see you over there all right oh no i'm caught oh no get over there fritz get over to that other are you kidding are you kidding what just happened there um what happened to my restream chat there we go. Hey, I'm over here now, and um, I'm, I've got my lighting needs just a little bit of help there. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. One second, one second. Just set that filter. I think that's a little bit better. That's probably a little bit better. There we go. All right. <sighs> I missed a couple questions there at the end um, the, before before I cut over here. You can still hear me? Well, good. <laughs> good. I'm, I'm glad to hear that, Carl. And I've, uh, I've got my teleprompter online here. I can see everything. All right. And there you go. There's the songs that are playing as we're going live with Stream Beats today from Harris Heller using the EDM playlist. Oh, all right. So, minimal code, minimal APIs with .NET. Will I be show, sharing the code? I always do, Distinguished Moments. Check it out. You're on YouTube. If you're on YouTube, check out the link just below here. You'll, you'll see the link to all the code that we're writing. I'm going to open up Firefox over here and, and jump in and show you exactly where everything is. Uh, it is on github.com, C Sharp Fritz, C Sharp, with C Sharp Fritz. There you go. It's right there. Um, and today we are down under, we are in sessions, we are in season one, and we are looking at 0114 minimal. And there's the same readme that I'm showing you on screen. The code samples that we're going to go through are in these two folders here. And any other code that we write, any other tuning that we do here live on stream, I will uh, commit and upload into this repository. So if you're watching the recording, this might not look exactly the same, what I'm showing on GitHub, with what you see when you navigate here. I may have added some content. I may have written a little bit more prose and added some links down here to help support a little bit of what we've learned, maybe a little bit of what the chat room was discussing and suggesting we get into. I may add to this and, and expand a little bit. Um, please understand that the GitHub repository is a live repository. It's going to evolve and change, and it might not be the same as what you're seeing right here today. All right. So um, you like Visual Studio Code, but it is not full, fully compatible with C Sharp 10, says Otic. Disagree. And I will show you. Let me, let me show you that to get things started right now. Let's do that. So I still see a bunch of folks from YouTube chiming in. Um, folks on Twitch, you, you out there? Hello? There we go. I think we just went... Did we go? No, we didn't go around the horn. All right. So I'm actually in Visual Studio Code here. Um, and I'm going to start with, the, with a contact app. Let's build a simple contact application using... I'm not going to go all the way to minimal APIs yet, but I want to take advantage of some of these initial features that are available to us in C Sharp 10 that will help us to understand how we can interact with, with data, interact with some of these things before we start layering in ASP.NET Core. Ah, good, there you are, Twitch friends. So good to see you. I saw a bunch of YouTube in a row and, and didn't see anything come through over there. Hey, Chris Jones, 
Sean O and St. G85. Fantastic. Good to see you. Been using Coderish on Twitch has been using minimal APIs for a month and they're loving it so far. Terrific. Uh, yes, Twitch is another streaming surface. Um, and we're over on Twitch TV, twitch.tv slash visual studio. So there's Tester Coder with the Heat Guys emote. All right. So I'm going to start building next to the, the finished versions of these apps here. Um, so let's do this. Let's, uh, let's clear and yeah. So let's call this, um, let's call this my first app, right? Ugh, no, no, Fritz, uh, hang on. That's bad idea. Let's create a new console application to start here. My first app. And this takes advantage of C Sharp 10 and our new templates that are available in .NET 6 to give you an application that is very small and has just those, uh, those lines of code that you need to get started building an application. So I'm gonna go back over here and you'll see there's my first app and it's got a project file here with some things to find and we'll talk about what those are in a minute. And I've got a program CS that has just a very simple hello world, okay? Um, so let's get into, uh, I'm not gonna get into validation as part of this, um, but it's certainly something you can layer on easily. Uh, let me add, now I'll leave this where it is. So I'm, I'm actually gonna build exactly the same content that's in the contact app uh, project, but we're gonna do it live here and talk through this. Um, so I have just a console right line that says hello world and that looks like some of the code we've been building in our notebooks um, and consequently I can say .NET run and it will compile and run that and I get a very simple hello world being output big deal but what's going on under the covers here is those the there are things that we didn't touch on, we didn't need to cover when we were building and working with notebooks called using statements and namespaces. And using statements and namespaces are ways for us to keep our code organized so that we can have our objects laid out across all of uh, our folders and, and our, our projects that we're gonna be sharing in a way that, that creates a little bit of nomenclature a little bit of structure that we can share and, and make available to folks in a way that makes sense and can grow and doesn't trample over other objects. So you define a namespace to house the content of your classes and, and enums and structs, all of those things that you're creating. You add using statements to indicate in your files, well, use the contents from this folder from this namespace, I'm sorry, scratch that. You add using statements to declare use the contents from this namespace without having to include the namespace in working with my content. So if I wanted to work with, let's say, a, a string reader, I could refer to it as system uh, IO, well, uh, I said string reader, string reader. I can use that entire syntax right there. And that gets a little right overwhelming to have to write system IO string reader everywhere. So what we do is we shorten that, get rid of the namespace, and we add a using statement. And now it knows what string reader is. So I can say string reader SR equals new string reader, right? Without that using statement, it gets a little confused. What's a string reader? Um, Give me one second. Uh, let's do that. And it, it's gonna get confused. It doesn't know what that string reader is. Ooh, what do I, where's that coming from, right? Um, and I'll run a quick build there just to show you that it throws the error. This isn't in the project file. That's why it's choking. Yes, I know, I know. Um, <laughs> my first app, I'm not in the right folder. Now .NET built that. 
There it is. See, there's the error. Oh, I don't know what this is. So, um, go up one. .NET SLN add my first app. And now it should pick up what that is. I'm even going to reload the window. So I'm in Visual Studio Code, and it shouldn't know what that is now. And I should get a little underline showing me, hey, that's a problem. Or, right, it shouldn't be picking that up. Because I removed that. Thank you. Yes. No. Uh, fine. Come on. There it is. It doesn't know what these things are. It's got this red underline because I don't know what that is. I need a using statement to help tell it, well, here's where you, you find string reader. Or uh, here's another one so it can find console. So, um, and I, I have the wrong syntax here for creating a new string reader, right? Um, so, okay. Come here. So, right now I've got a compliant string reader and I'm off and running. In .NET 6, I, I showed previously, we don't need these using statements because we have something called implicit usings. And that's what I commented out over here. And that generates a series of using statements that are made available inside of our project that simplify our code in files like this. Let me take a look at chat and get caught up here. Uh, why am I not using Visual Studio? Uh, because somebody said that uh, they wanted to see me use Visual Studio Code with C Sharp 10 and .NET 6. Um, is the image blurring? It shouldn't. Oh my gosh, Why did my, what happened to my... There we go. The, the camera is... Yes, why is my camera focus going out here? Hello? That's weird. Um, that it's losing focus so bad. I, th I need to turn off autofocus, it looks like. All right. Um, let me see what else is going on. Get those glasses in prescription? Yes, you can. These are from Gunner, and they do make it. Uh, they do make uh, prescription versions of these. Um, we're not talking about F-sharp today. Please stop going back to that. Um, what versions of Core? We're using .NET 6. Um, yes, and we're going to show global usings in just a minute. Um, and, and let's see. It's not distance to camera. I think it's focusing on my background a little bit. Um, all right. So we have these top-level statements that we can write into our program CS file, just like we had um, inside of our notebooks. We were able to write code directly at the top of our application. We didn't have to write classes in order or structs or enums to to start working with our content. We can do that now in our program CS. We can have one file that has here's those first lines of code that you should execute when this application is started. This means that we can um, we can interact with we can interact with the command line request directly here before we hand off to all the object-oriented capabilities that we want from our classes, structs, and the like. So let's let's introduce, let's bring in, yes, I'm doing the link to CSV demo. So let me bring in, um, I'm going to go into my first app, and let me add the link to CSV NuGet package so I can create some, some additional interesting capabilities here. So I'm going to say .NET add package link to CSV and this will download that NuGet package that will allow me to query a CSV file with link statements. So there it is, it's downloaded and it's installed in my project. There's the reference right there. Let me go back up here and I can now load and interact with that. So I can create a context so I can say new link to CSV dot CSV context. And I now have the ability to read and interact with um, 
a, a CSV file, a comma separated value file, uh, think like a spreadsheet, right? An Excel sh uh, spreadsheet, maybe a Google Doc that you saved in comma separated value CSV format, we can now read and interact with here directly. Yeah, not seeing a class is strange, Padaro. You're right. Um, two, 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 two. Yes, this is C sharp. Um, how can somebody create their own link to CSV? Why? Somebody's already created it. I mean, enhance it a little bit, maybe, but... Um, is it just templates that hide the usings? No. You can still show it if you want. You can still enable it. Those are implicit usings here. If, if you remove that, you're now required to add them. You're now going to get errors that, like that one, that say, well, you need to declare these. It's up to you if you want to enable or disable them using that statement right there, implicit usings. Turn that on or off appropriately to interact with that. Yes, we are going to get into EF Core. So, I'm keeping an eye on the time here. So, I've declared and added uh, this capability and, uh, yeah, put implicit usings back on. There it goes. So, now I can create a CSV file on disk inside this folder. So, let's create a new file. I will call this contacts csv and we can put some stuff in here um right so uh let's put name um streaming service yeah let's just say name and streaming service um and i'm gonna say fritz uh twitch i'm gonna just roll off a couple names here there's johan on twitch who else do i see here? i see obina on uh youtube Let me see who else do I see here. Andy on YouTube. What, uh, let me keep scrolling here. Um, let me see. Um, so meet on on YouTube. Sure. All right. Um, that's good. That's plenty to start here. All right, so I've got a little CSV file and I wanna load these in and interact with them in my application. I can do that by creating now some sort of a, a contact class that I want to work with and I can read that content into that class and interact with it. So let's create a public uh, record class. I'll call it contact. And there were two fields, name and streaming service. So let's create those two fields as properties. String, and I haven't, name and I'll create another one and it was streaming service and those properties I've defined to purposely match the headers on that contact file so that I can load and read those now there was a question about well how do you organize this stuff so it it becomes a little bit easier to manage well let's move that contact out into a folder here let's call it models and I'm going to take this contact object, move it to its own file. That I did a control period there to jump into that. And I'm going to go to move type to contact CS. You can't see it. It was behind me. Do that again. Control dot. There it is. And I'm going to say move type to contact CS. Okay. When I look over in my, um, my, my file explorer over here, there's contact CS, but I want it actually inside my models folder. And there it is. Now, when you have a class in a folder like this, it's you want to put a namespace around that to reflect the organization that you have on disk. So I can declare a namespace around this like this. Okay. And typically the content inside that namespace is tabbed over. Now, Another one of those C-Sharp 10 features we learned about previously is file scoped namespaces. This block wrapping the model is a little, it's just, why do I tab things over when there's only one namespace in this file? So let's just make it, right? Just a, what we now call a file scoped namespace. So this is a .NET 6 feature that's available. And now I have my contact it's in the models namespace that I can go and work with. Actually, it should be my first app. 
models. Okay. So I'll go back to my program CS and I can now read things into that model's uh, contact object using my link to CSV here. So I can say var contacts equals CTX read. And I want to read them into my first app models contact, right? You see the little bit of organization that we have there. And I'm reading that from contacts CSV, okay? Everything ironed out here and it's all clear, no underlines. So I'm gonna read that content and just paint it on the screen. Now I made contact a record class, so I could just put a, a two string with it and just output that data. So for each contact in contacts, um, I'll just say console, right line, contact, okay? Now, we can organize this a little bit. I could turn this into a using statement here for these, right? And delete that namespace, generate the using statement, put that at the top of the file. Makes it a little bit easier to read. I could do the same thing with link to CSV, right? Get rid of that and turn this into a using statement. Sure. Um, and if we .NET run, it should go through our list of contacts and just output, um, there they are. Fritz, Johan, Obina, Andy, and Sumit. There we go. And the services that they're connecting and watching on right now. Easy. And and we, we did a bit of this before we talked about C Sharp 10 and .NET 6. But let's level this up. Let's take this approach and let's put it into ASP.NET so we can interact with a contacts list that is now stored in a database. We learned a little bit about Entity Framework Core, so let's use those techniques, that technology, to get data out of the database, to put data into the database, and deliver a very cool little API around that in just a couple lines of code here that uh, will be something productive for folks to use. Let me take a look back at chat and catch up here. Um, yes, with source generators, you can create classes automatically. Yes. Um, we're not talking about that today. You mentioned the implicit usings are, are still compiled down, contains all the required dependencies behind the scenes. Um, Sean, so to your question, the, impl the, Im the implied usings, right? Right? The implicit usings here actually get generated and are sitting over here inside of the obj folder. If you ever need to take a look, there they are. My first app, global usings dot G for generated files. And here's the usings that were generated for you because you turned on implicit usings. So they're still there. They're generated and sitting there on disk so that it knows how to refer to them and and what to um, what to include appropriately. There's a page in the docs in the in the C sharp ten docs that will show you what the implicit usings are for the different project types in .NET. Um, web APIs can be consumed using HTTP client. Yes, and that's right. Implicit usings are quite frankly a compiler trick. Uh, what if a comma happens within one of the entries, asks Bulat. Um, if I, you can, it, using link to CSV, you can put double quotes around words and it will uh, appropriately escape that quote for you. That's why you prefer tab delimited and not comma separated to each of their own. Um, uh, records in C Sharp, introduced in C Sharp 9, that's correct. Uh, are immutable. You are correct. We're getting more and more functional stuff in C-sharp. You better believe it. Um, English only, please. Human world. Um, positional records are immutable. Yes. Why well, need a uh, using for models and not for system? Because system was generated with one of my implicit usings, and models is not. Thank you for asking that question. I can make that go away by including... A, um, I can in, I can generate a using here 
that is enforced across the project. Um, and this is, uh, uh, what was it? My first app dot models. Yeah. Right? I think I have that right. I think I have that right. Do I have that right? Uh, so now if I go back over here, I should be able to comment that out. Try building that. No, I got it wrong. Um, shoot. It is... Is it global using? I forget what the, There's a way to include a using statement in here. Um, did I include it in... No, I didn't include it, include it over here. Um, I'm forgetting that syntax. Yeah, using include. I thought I had that right. Do I just need to put that down here and not in property group? Is that what I did wrong? Yeah, there it is. So put that using statement in here, and now it applies across the entire application, which also means I can put it into project build properties files and lay them out, and it just gets enforced in all the project files. I can also create a global using statement in some other file, right? Um, I, I like the idea of creating a file over here called usings. And I can write my own global using uh, my first app models. And come here, you. I've got too many files going on. I've lost myself. And then I can comment that out. Ah, oh, come on. It's so long, it's hiding way over here. But that builds properly with the global using statement. So you can put that using statement wherever you'd like and in whatever file you'd like. Um, some folks like to see it in the project file so it's easy to pick up it, that it's all right there. I like the idea of an underscore usings file because as an ASP.NET developer, I'm used to an underscore imports file that contains my, um, that contains information about the Razor templates I want to import. CSV to SQL, no, not gonna quite go that far. Uh, that's right, Obina, that would be a positional syntax for a, a person record class. Um, console right line shows object, that's right, Siraj, because I created my contact as a record class. So you could create just a record contact, but now in C-sharp 10, we have record structs and record contacts. What are you doing to me here, Restream? It just refreshed and I lost chat. Yeah, I just lost chat on the teleprompter. Nice. Way to go. Um, ah, there we go. How smart is the implicit using if two dependencies have similar namespace? you'll get the same collision that you would if you had two using statements on top of each other in a file that had the same object in the same namespace. You'll get that collision where it, you'll, that same collision error where it reports, oh, I don't know what to do with this. All right. Um, cool. All right, so we got this working and it outputs and it shows us our contacts. Let's level this up now and bring in Entity Framework Core and, and start connecting that to a database and interacting with data for contact objects and see how that can grow and interact with um, interact with our application interact with our our data and web visitors that interact that want to visit our website all right uh, come on I think restream just took a powder on their chat didn't they Yeah, I'm getting nothing from Restream. Nice. 
Um, you find the yellow underlines and the properties. Restream here on my on my teleprompter has stopped. Try this again. Because I, I I want to be able to see you, chat room, and and keep up with what's going on over there. Yeah, I've lost it over here. Can I, am I able to get anywhere? Nice. Let me get reconnected here. No. One second. This is going to be a pain. Yeah. Hmm. All right, I'm going to keep going even though I can't see chat. Um, yes, folks are saying, what's with the yellow underlines? It's telling me that this could be nullable. Um, it, it's protecting me from running into nullability errors. If... Uh, did we get it? get reconnected here? No. Come on. This is weird. Try one more thing. Fun things that happen when you step away for a little bit and come back to your home studio. Like, hey, guess what? Nothing works. Yeah, it's not even seeing my phone to connect. Nice. Come on. There we go. Now I get chat back. All right. I missed a little bit of the last few, last little bits there. Um, so this is a nullability indicator. It's telling you that this value could be null at some point. Um, the nullability checks are defined right here. You can turn that on and off if you don't like seeing that. Let's build our first API project here and get going with this. Yeah, gremlins, right? Ugh, ugh. So let's build, let's add a minimal API project into this. Um, when you look at the list of projects that are available, we, these are the most commonly used ones, but it doesn't include that minimal API. So if I say .NET new list, so here's the ASP.NET projects. These are the web projects that are support developing and building web applications, HTTP endpoints that you want to work with. And empty is the one here that has the minimal API in it. If you build the web API one, it'll give you the classic way to build APIs with controllers. I'm always jumping out of focus. It's got to be the camera with autofocus turned on. Um, I thought it was being smart and turning on autofocus and it's misbehaving today nice nice um 
Okay. So let's go in, let's build a minimal um, API project here. So I'm going to jump up and we'll say down here, um, and move it to the top, Fritz. Come on now, you know better. Uh, .NET new web. So it creates an empty project that's set up for APIs. And I'll call this my first API. That should be dash O, not zero. And that's. Do that again. Because I spelled it poorly. Get started right. There we go. All right, good. Back over. This time, let's open it with um, with full Visual Studio 2022. Um, I'll, I'll put it in the solution file here first, Fritz. Uh, .NET SLN add uh, my first API. Good. All right, let's go to Visual Studio 2022. Take a look at how this works over there. Now that I've shown that it does work in um, .NET 6 and C Sharp 10 um, work here. Do not delete this stream. Nope, we don't uh, LV low VSO. This gets archived. You'll see it on the uh, youtube.com slash .NET channel. Look for the playlist, C Sharp with C Sharp Fritz, and you'll find all of my videos in there. So we're gonna open a project solution and I'm going to go, not in dev intersection, we are in C Dev, C Sharp with C Sharp Fritz, Sessions, Season 1, Minimal. Here we are. This machine's a little bit older and was patched for uh, Spectre and Meltdown. Um, so, runs a little bit slower when I'm running Docker in the background. <gasps> Spoiler alert! So here's my first API right here. I'm gonna set that as the startup project. It's still loading other things in the background. There we go. When we take a look at the program CS file here, you're gonna see that it looks kind of similar to what we had before to get started. So I have a builder that's going to create a web application here. This is how we get things started with an ASP.NET Core, with a web application, is we create some sort of a web application and we're gonna build it, put all our configuration stuff into this builder thing. We're going to say, build that, and here's our first API. Map a request when you try to get the root of this little web application to return hello world. We got this little lambda statement here that we're going to go through, execute, whenever that is requested, return hello world and run the application. Run the browser and it's just gonna sit there and wait for interactions. So let's start this and see what happens. Where'd my coffee go? We need that coffee. Coffee is good. And this is going to give us that very, very basic, very simple hello world instance with our API. It's gonna start up a browser for me here in the background. There we go. There we go, and hello world. Big deal. Great, we've got hello world. Um, you build a proxy lega legacy API for Microsoft SQL routing in 33 C-sharp lines of code. That's fantastic, that's very cool. Absolutely. Stay at home gamer on YouTube asks any chance you can define a tag for the CS proj file like implicit usings and have a custom set of usings behind it or is the way to go for that using a underscore using CS file you can create a directory uh, a build properties file that sits inside your solution and it will apply that build property to all of your projects we do something similar in the Blazor Workshop that's available. So um, I will show you what that looks like. It's inside github.com slash C Sharp Fritz slash Blazor Workshop. This is actually forked from the .NET presentations version, but it's it's my version. I, I like my version, but you can go find the original version at uh, github.net presentations slash Blazor Workshop. 
And there's this directory build properties file. And you can certainly put those properties, those using statements that you want to be in all of your projects in a file like this. And it gets inherited and applied to all the projects in the solution. So very cool stuff. It's just based on that, um, I think it's .props file name. It loads those in. Um, I forget ex if it's exactly the file name. My MS build knowledge is, is slipping here. But update, uh, create one of these files, put it at the root next to your solution file, and you can put those using statements in here so everybody gets it. Thanks for the question. Let me see what else is going on here. Um, Podaro asks, what's Visual Studio built with? .NET. We use .NET to build Visual Studio. Um, it's WPF. Uh, there's a bunch of C++ in there. but um, Are we going to use Entity Framework with SQLite? That's right, Patrick. Yes, we are. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba, scrolling, scrolling. Um, what? Um, looking through the questions here. Looks more like Node.js. Ricky, yeah, you're right. Looks a lot like Node.js. Um, looks like Node with Express. Let's, let's dig in a little bit further here. So I want to set up an entity framework context that allows me to write to a SQLite database, and I want to create that same contact object and, and stash it in that database. So how do we go through and do those things? I'm going to start by stopping my API here. Uh, I'm going to right click and let's manage NuGet packages and I'm going to add to this uh, Microsoft, oh shoot, just, well, uh, it was right there. Entity Framework Core SQLite. Uh, this one right here. Go ahead and put that one into the project. Yep, it's going to install a whole bunch of other dependencies. Yes, I accept. You can have my firstborn. <gasps> Don't tell her that. Um, there it is. So now it's installed. It's available in the... Uh, there it is. The little green check. It's installed in the project. So now I can use Entity Framework Core to define a connection string to a database. I can define what my contacts object looks like and start working through being able to interact with those things. So let's start off creating that contact object again. So public record class contact and I want um, I want those properties. So uh, let's create a property for name. There we go cool um, string and I will once again have streaming service I need to put an ID on here so we have a unique ID for these things so I'll just create an ID field there we go okay now once again I can start to organize these things and put that into a models folder let's not do that just yet because I want to create that database context so let's create my DB public class my db context and this is a db context and yes we need to know what that is come on so i'm going to get a using statement for that fine and i want to create a collection of contacts that we're going to work with so let's create that collection i'll use my uh, prop um what's it called I'm forgetting the feature name. My prop shortcut to, to drive into this real quick. For Entity Framework Core, we want to define a collection of these objects. It's a DB set type, DB set of type contact, and I will call this uh, contacts. Okay. Now I have my my database context. I do need to provide a constructor for this that is appropriate for <clears throat> and I forget exactly what the ah there we go I need a DB context options so I need to receive um, 
right? A DB context options class, no, um, of type my DB context. And I'll just call that options. And I need to pass that into the base so that it knows how to build my database context. Okay, great. I've got these two classes set up so that it knows how to interact with the database. Now let's move these. Now let's put these into a models folder over here. So I will add a new folder called models. And let's push these out into their own files so we can work with them somewhere else. And I'm just gonna grab those two files and put them into the models folder, yes. Now, right, I should be able to control dot on this. There we go, change namespace. And it puts the namespace and it, it wraps it with the old style block, that's fine. Um, and if I go back over here to my DB context, I can take this and change its namespace as well, okay? So it eliminated that extra namespace call. We're good here on the construction and interaction of these. So back over in my program, um, if I wanna work with those objects, I need a using statement for my models folder. So my first fine, right? Did I, did I just call it models and not my first API models? No, I did. Uh, yeah, I don't have anything in this file yet. Okay, so now we need to make that entity framework context available before we can start interacting with it. I have 15 minutes to go here. Oh, baby. All right, so when we wanna make that entity framework context available for use across the rest of my application, I need to put it inside of a service locator. And the service locator for ASP.NET Core is right here, builder.services. And I'm gonna add, uh, what is it? Add context, add database context, there it is. And I'm gonna specify the name of my context here, which was, right, my DB context. But I do need to give it that configuration information that I'm using SQLite and the name of the database file that I wanna write into. So we're going to define that with a little bit of a lambda here. And I'm going to say options dot, um, where is it? Use SQLite, give me my, I need a using statement for that. And now I can give it a connection string to work with. Now I could pull that connection string out of configuration, but I'm gonna force it here because I'm creating just a little sample. So I'm gonna say data source equals contacts.db. All right, so I now have a SQLite database defined, how to connect to it, where to go get that data put a semi at the end of that. And I can start working with that, that entity framework context to build and interact with the database. So let's get an instantiated version of that DB context so that we can start working with the data inside the APIs that I'm gonna write down here. So um, let's create a context. Um, and actually, I don't even need that. Yeah, um, no, let's, let's start here and work backwards. Uh, app dots, uh, services, I'm going to get service, right? Yeah, my DB context, there we go. And now I'm gonna say uh, context database um, ensure created. So make sure that there's a database on disk that has all the things in it for me to interact with it. Um, I believe I need to create the migration that goes with this. So before I go too much further, my first API, .NET EF migrations add first. So this is gonna build, make sure that we have that contact object and we're able to work with the database. Um, you make me sad. What did I mistake? What did I mistake here? Woo! Entity framework core does not exist. 
Uh, yes, it does. Uh, yes, it does. It does, it does. It's right there. It says everything's there. What am I missing? Are you kidding me? Um, just to make sure, just to make sure. No, really? Go back over to the other project. Microsoft Entity Framework Core SQLite. There it is. Why isn't it restoring it for this project? That succeeded. Try that migration ad again. Ah, okay. Uh, .NET add package, that one. generate our content do it again uh, oh WPF uh, yeah it was used with WPF um, why build API's in the old way when there's minimal API uh, there's um, folks like the organization of it and there's other capabilities to interact and um, structure things a little bit cleaner so, record classes are just like types in TypeScript. Yes, I see lots of questions that came through. I'm trying to keep up. Um, let me see here. Yeah, I'm having a great day. I, why it compiled one and not the other, don't know. Don't know. That's lots of fun. There we go. All right. So I have my migration. It's going to be able to generate and write the file. So let's move on. Um, yeah, I know it might be null there. So now I can do things like go get the list of contacts inside of that database and write it out when you navigate to the slash contacts location. So I can map a get and say, well, let's let's when you go to slash contacts, give me a my DB context, right? And I can say easily here, return context uh, dot, where is it? Contacts, there we go. Uh, yeah. Okay, and I mean, I could even really simplify that to right just, right just that syntax right and now when I run this right you I made it very very clear exactly what we want it to do I'm gonna run this and uh, what do you mean you cannot resolve it uh, oh, oh, oh I didn't create a scope do, 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 do. so uh, app dot services create scope dot Come here, you. Do it again. Entity framework objects are scoped in context. They're available for the entire duration of a request. So we need to get a scope in order to return things. So there's my hello world. And if I go to slash contacts, 
I get no data because we didn't write any data into our database yet. So I can start to level this up and add new features to it. Um, and I've only got a few minutes left, eight minutes left. Let me go to the completed version of the app and walk you through some of that code so you can see a little bit of what's going on here. So just like we did before, we have a database context. Let me come to these in a second. So there's create scope, get service. And here we're setting up those mapped APIs, contacts for get interactions, post because we want to add, we want to create a new contact. And we're, we have this argument list that we're defining inside of this lambda here, right? It's just a signature for a, a method. So I'm defining um, here, this is an asynchronous instance of one, but I'm defining a database context and a contact. That contact is being provided by some sort of a post interaction, right? It's in the body of that up upload that's being added to this, okay? So that upload has that new contact as payload, so I'm saying we'll just add it, save changes, and then return a appropriate created, right? A 201 statement that says, I created it, here's where you can find it, at newcontact.id, whatever that ID number is for that contact. I have a map get here, that has this bit right here. See that ID int? That is a routing parameter. We're capturing the ID as the next element of, of the URL string here, of the folder uh, path. And it's gonna be an ID, it's gonna be an integer. We're gonna put it into the ID field that's captured right there. And we'll use that to do a find. Go find me a contact that has that key. I have similar methods here for put and delete that will uh, update and delete records appropriately. I'll let you go through that source code. It's in the project linked down below. But I've also added open API into this. I've added the uh, swashbuckle project, which gives me swagger here, right? So swagger, this is the old name for open API. It was called swagger. So we have a context API, and this is still got my dev intersection bit in here. I'll just delete that. And when I run this context API, this has a slightly different context structure, but we'll take a look in and uh, run this one instead. So let's set this as the startup project. And we'll run that, and we'll be able to see a little bit of this. Uh, Alright, so there's my hello world. And if I go to slash contacts, I get th these contact records have a city field. So I've got Fritz and he's in Philadelphia. I've got Scott and Scott's from Seattle. But I've also got the ability to get just a single one of those if I type it correctly here. I just want record one. There it finds record one and presents that. I have the Swagger um, API definitions all set up here for me so I can use open API. I can generate a client if I want from this documentation and you see the location of it is sitting right here and I get this JSON file that has all the information about the API that's defined because I added those couple of elements inside of my minimal API and all of this content can be used to generate strongly typed clients that will be able to connect in and work with my little contacts API. I've also got some great documentation here so I can add and change and work with content. So if I wanna add a new contact, I can click try it out here and we can add somebody new. Um, I don't know. Uh, uh, let me add. Let me add my friend Javier, and uh, he's in Des Moines. All right, and execute that, and it returns a message here that says th that's what the curl looked like. 
And Javier is now this record ID3, and it returns to me also a header that says you can find Javier at slash contacts slash three. So just to show that I can do that, let's close that up. Here's that get that'll take in an ID field. So let's try that out, an ID parameter. I'll ask for ID three, and there it is. There's the curl request that it made. That's the location that it went to. There's the response that I got. So we can do a lot here quickly with ASP.NET Core building these APIs, and I've written it all in, and this one has all of the entity framework and uh, object in the same file, but I wrote it all in 54 lines of code, and I can add it to Docker, give this Docker capabilities by right click, add, and I can choose, I have it running right now, I can't, it's not in my dialog box there. Right click on that and say add Docker support, and it will generate a Docker file for me. So we can click through, and you'll see it generates a Docker file that looks like this. I changed this slightly to give it the Alpine um, base image to use, but that means I can go over here and I can create and work with my contact API Docker image, and it's only 100 meg. So I wrote one C sharp file, compiled it, put it into a container. It's 100 meg, it's ready to go, ready to be deployed to use wherever you need it. Let me head back to the other uh, desk out so we can wrap up. All right. All right, all right. Back over here. It is so good to be with you today, chat. We went through a ton there so quickly. Um, but I hope I hope that that meant something. I hope you, you can go through and you can take a look at those samples. I showed you where the link is to download. Um, it is GitHub, com, uh, oh, crumbs. Go to the actual GitHub and copy the location here before you paste it in chat. Da, 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 da. Let me go grab the complete URL location. It is right there. I'll paste that into chat so you can take a look and, and get involved with that. I'm going to be around for, uh, on, uh, uh, Twitter. If you have questions, if you have questions, drop them in the comment section below. I I read those and answer them every every few days. I, I make a pass through and, and try and read and catch up on things. Um, thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in. I'll be back tomorrow. Hang on, switch switch music here, Fritz. Um, yeah, there we go. I'll be back tomorrow uh, over on my channel over on twitch.tv slash C Sharp Fritz. Um, we've got a couple things we're doing here for Thank Miss for the, the end of the year here. Um, and uh, it should be a good time hanging out with some of our friends from Progress Software and the Code It Live channel. I will, uh, I will be back on Thursday with a full day of coding over on my channel. We'll be writing some Blazor code working with Azure um, and RavenDB. It promises to be a good time. Can I link that channel? Absolutely. My channel that you'll find me on is twitch.tv slash C Sharp Fritz. Those of you that are on YouTube, I hope you have a fantastic day. Take care. Um, and those of you that are on Twitch, let me take a look around the horn here and see who we can raid, who we can set up and get you connected with that's having some tech fun that would certainly be interesting to support. Um, I think somebody that, that um, yeah, somebody who's, who we've raided before who's, who's friendly to the stream here. Let's go and raid our friend Tim Baudet um, and support him. Thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in. The, this video, like all the other videos in this series, you can find over on the YouTube archive, youtube.com slash dot net. Check out the playlists and look for Learn C Sharp with C Sharp Fritz. 
I really appreciate you tuning in. I love our AMA sessions together. I'm going to be taking off from this stream for the next two weeks, and I will see you again in January 2022, where we're going to pick up learning a little bit about ASP.NET Core. All right. Get ready to say hi to my friend Tim over on Twitch. Those of you on YouTube, have a fantastic day. Check out some of the other great videos we have here on YouTube. If you're on Twitch, get ready to say hi to our friend Tim, and I will catch you next time. Take care.